Welcome to the course, Basics Digital Storytelling. So the topic of this lecture is digital drawing. It's basically an introduction to digital in design, vector graphics and graphical projections. First, I would like to also explain a little bit further uh, following the topics that we talked about last Friday, uh, the, the meaning of the word digital, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion um, among not students necessarily, but among basically architects and designers, and I think just professionals. Uh, there's just, I think, a misunderstanding of what this term really means and where it comes from. So I would like to kind of give you, uh, I would like to give you a little bit um, my view on the things or, and um, my perspective, let's say. So basically the digital, digital does not presuppose use of computers. And this might sound like, a non-true or not true statement, like a false statement. But I would argue, and through this whole course, I'm, I'm going to argue this. Um, and you can again challenge me there. Maybe one day we can have a discussion in person about it as well. But basically, digital does not pre presuppose use of computers. Uh, rather, it is a way of thinking about the world. And I'm going to try to also prove to you that it, it is really so. Okay, so the term digital comes from the Latin di uh, digitus, which um, refers to a finger or toe. Uh, and it's in a way related to counting and numbers. Or so I have my hands, and I can use my hand for counting, uh, especially if you think about illiterate societies uh, very early on, even there were many Romans who didn't know how to read or write, of course, um, but they could still count because they had their kind of hand and you would kind of like a child count on your hand. So somehow, for, for me, and, or I think it is very useful to think about term digital in, in that sense, or to think about it as uh, involving sort of mm, describing the world through numbers and I mean, counting, but kind of numbers indirectly. Um, I think that will give you a much better picture of um, what the term is really, really about. And again, to give you a sort of a, one argument for this view, uh, Alberti, so Leon Battista Alberti, who wrote a book, Terre uh, Edificatoria, uh, nine, uh, was here 1485. So this is, uh, let me just see, 500, 540 years ago. So you'll probably learn in art history about, uh, about this architect. Um, so he wrote, so this is kind of quite a famous book in art history circles. He was also the first. Uh, let's say kind of renaissance thinker who would define the role of an architect so be, again a bit longer story but before that the authors of buildings were rather anonymous so think about kind of old gothic cathedrals or romanesque cathedrals in germany france spain uh, they were built by by anonymous master builders we don't really know their names um, they were part of guilds they kind of constructed you know stone buildings churches some of them are some of them are still um there today but their names are lost and they are kind of lost on purpose or we kind of we had books back in that time but we, uh, somehow the, the idea was not that um or the idea was that there's no really an author of a building or you're kind of a servant of god and you're just constructing these and you don't pay credit for it but in renaissance the perspective changed a little bit toward this kind of um in a way, the role of an architect was created. Also, Albert was the first one who said, um, or one of the first ones who said that, well, the one who draws the building is the one who created the design, and that's the author of the building. And then, of course, there's somebody else who is building it, who's actually constructing the building, but it is the architect who is the author. So he was the first one who was kind of thinking or kind of created uh, this clear delineation or separation between sort of design and kind of act of production, which is, I think, not really good i think it's very detrimental to our profession and of course today we still we don't really think like this anymore uh somehow the situation changed of course after 400 years but also why i'm because it may be a very long intro into alberti but um why this is interesting is because it turns out that alberti in this book uh, defined for the first time something that i would call the first digital map in history also it's called the scriptio urbis rome which is like the the description of the city of rome and this is on the left, it's actually a reconstruction of this description because he didn't really, uh, he just, so uh, he didn't really kind of, he, he didn't create a map, but he described how could you construct a map by basically giving polar coordinates of all the monuments in Rome. Or so 
in the, uh, he, would, he would kind of give a description of where the locations on the map are and he would just write them in a text and he would basically give them coordinates and then the idea would be that you could go step by step through these coordinates and just redraw the map by yourself so this actually on the left is a reconstruction a recent reconstruction of, of this but done according to his instructions uh, basically Rome in his time and um and if you think about it that's a little bit how how in a way that computers work you know so they have sets of instructions and they use these to construct things on the screen or so even, even this thing that you see on the screen the picture it's just described as you know, in terms of sort of pixels and they kind of live in the computer memory so they are in a way defined this image is defined through numbers in in, in the computer uh, so it's defined in a digital way but this is also a digital map because it's also defined through um, through numbers or um, so Okay, that's a little bit something for you to think about. And then the other term that I always keep on referring to in the lectures, even though it's never in the title anywhere, it's computation, also to compute something. So computation is a, the action of mathematical calculation, and it includes both arithmetical and non-arithmetical steps. So in a way, it is, it is like an algorithm. And um, imp again, important um, idea here is that mm, once when you define once when you, let's say, use digital representation of things, for, of course, for us, uh, we talk about digital representation of design, drawings, images. So that's what's interesting for us. Um, then we can actually perform computation um, on, um, on this sort of data. Right? So we can kind of combine these two things because once when you have numbers, we can use numbers to compute, to calculate. And again, this seems like very abstract, but it's not really far off what's happening in nature or so this is at least one example there are many others of conus textile uh, that's a shell um, mollusk i think displaying chaotic but deterministic pattern uh, from wolfram seller automata rule 30 or so if you're studying uh, computational design you'll come across seller automata systems and there's uh, steven wolfram who is also the creator of the Wolfram website, uh, Wolfram Alpha website. Let's see chat here. Okay, um, and um, and basically he then described these sort of simple seller automata rules. One of them is called Rule Thirty, so it's defined kind of completely al algorithm or algorithmically, and this this rule describes almost exactly the pattern of this shell here. So it's somehow somewhere in this shell. In, in this living organism, the potentially similar calculation is happening. Probably not on, uh, it's not like top down, but it's probably kind of happening somehow um, bottom up, you know, from the shell as it's growing, then this pattern kind of emerges, but the rules are the same. Or so somehow the idea is that when we talk about computation, we again don't, don't talk about computers necessarily. It's just that today we use computers to perform computation because it's just very convenient. But computation kind of existed way before we had um, computers or this idea of calculating things. Um, one example of, again, talking about computation and algorithms and drawing. Again, this is not really a topic of this course, but I just want to give you the, that, that pers perspective. Or so you can think about I'm drawing a line. Or so I'm drawing a line and I'm just defining two points on the line. And then I just say the line is between these two points, or that's enough for me to define how a line looks like. And in Python code, this is actually directly from Rhino, so you can write this code in Rhino here on the left. Um, we define point one, some kind of point object uh, as X and Y coordinates, uh, point two as different X and Y coordinates, and then you say, well, line is just, you know, add line between, between these two points. Um, so it's in a way a mathematical way of thinking about drawing, again, when you draw in Rhino, you don't really draw like this, but this is kind of a little bit what's happening uh, behind the scenes. You cannot draw a line without defining two points, or um, you need to be, as soon as you define two points, you can draw a line. And, and um, this, this way of thinking also kind of presupposes that, that you need to have sort of a coordinate system. Or So this only makes sense, the coordinates only make sense. If I have the origin, I have a coordinate system. So I have origin, I have an X and Y axis. So I have to add some structure to the world. And if I do that, then I'm able to sort of draw with algorithms or draw with these uh, kind of sets of operations. And again, that's why in Rhino, 
um, well, in all CAD programs, but kind of all software, there's always somehow an implied coordinate system, or this always exists, even 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 on your screen. On your screen, there is like every pixel has, in a way, a coordinate. Or uh, there's X and there's Y, and specifically on screens, the Y the Y axis goes down, which is a bit weird, but that's just how how it is. So if you add a little bit of structure, you can uh, you can start kind of exploiting and basically kind of merging in a way design and computation in this digital realm. Again, you can do the same thing on a paper. It's just more convenient to do it on a computer. Uh, to push it a bit further, you can almost think of, well, what is then my drawing? Or in this case, uh, this is a uh, model of a bicycle wheel. Well, your drawing can then also become, you can sort of parameterize that drawing. Or because once when you define everything in these, uh, in these terms of kind of basically an algorithm, drawing is just an algorithm, then you can say, well, now the parameters of that algorithm are, uh, they're not fixed, I can change them. And I can actually visually, so I can rewrite this uh, in a visual way. And I maybe should have done this example here. I just realized that <clears throat> we're being good to, to just do that example. But here's another example of, yeah, you, I can create a, in a way a par parametric model. And why this is useful is that then I can, I can kind of, once when these relations are established, I can go back and change the initial parameters that are used. So I can change the diameter of this bicycle wheel, the number of these, I forgot how they're called, but these kind of tensile <clears throat> wires. Uh, I can change maybe even the, well, the thickness of the wire and uh, the thickness of the tire and so on. So I can actually change the model after it was created um, because it's the computer that does the drawing. I just kind of define the relations how the drawing should be established. Again, this is not really how we will draw um, in this course, but this is just something that I would like to kind of just strongly point out that um, this is something that is possible already with the software that you do, that I'll just show today. Okay, and I think this is the last slide maybe in this, uh, well, almost last slide in this small first introduction is the, um, this is uh, uh, Anthony Gaudi. Um, and um, so he built this very famous, or was building a very famous Sagrada Familia, so cathedral in Barcelona. It's, it's still not finished, as maybe some of you know. Um, and he used an inverted chain model to calculate, uh, to basically form find, to find a form where all the volts are in compression. Um, so again, this is maybe something that you've listened to in uh, structural uh, courses in structural design. If I have a hanging chain model, then all the chains are in tension. But when I flip it, if I have the same shape, then all these shapes are actually they have exactly the opposite. Um, if uh, they have the opposite forces acting in them, so they they uh, they become compression forces. And if I have stone vaults, I want to have compression forces because um, it's just easier to uh, it is easier to kind of transfer forces in masonry structures. Also, all the old cathedrals, um, the Gothic Romanesque cathedrals, and they're all done with these sort of uh, catenary vaults. Or, and in history, this was done through kind of trial and error. So churches were built and then they were built again and some of them would collapse and the ones that were good would stand. So they would be used as examples further in the future. But Anthony Gaudi kind of realized, wait, we can, you know, we don't have to do this trial and error. We can just sort of simulate in a model how this shape should look like. Or so this is kind of the onset of this uh, form finding in structural design. And again, this is, a, this is just an example of material computation. Or so even, even he, or today we would call this material computation. Um, and again, you can do the same thing in a computer. You can kind of calculate this in a computer, which is also a form of computation, but it's done in a, in a digital environment. But today, like uh, in the sort of uh, engineering community uh, or engineering terms, this is actually called material computation. So the material is actually computing or calculating how the, for, how the form should look like in order uh, that once when it, this form is inverted, all the, all the kind of, all the elements are in, in compression. Um, so again, one example where you can use computational thinking in design without using computers at all, because this project was done, I think it was beginning of the, this year, so I think it's beginning of the 19th century or maybe end of the or beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century. So more than 100 years ago. Okay, uh, more on these topics you can find in this book. Uh, it came in 2020, so 
um, I would just recommend it. So it's called Atlas of Digital Architecture. It's done by, um, it's like a collection of works by other authors. Um, most of them are from Zurich, so from ETH Zurich, uh, uh, where I actually worked for many years and studied there as well. So giving you this, this example. Um, so this book is kind of really thick. I actually have it on my table here. Uh, I can maybe actually show it quickly. And yeah, I guess you can get it in a library and I would even recommend you to buy it. I have no stake in this book, so I'm just recommending you because I think it's a very good book to have. And I wish I had it when I was a first year student. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so that's why I'm kind of recommending it to you. And if you're interested in these topics, the, this book goes really, really deep into, into this topic. So it's a, it's a great reference. Okay. Um, and now the second chapter is uh, explaining a little bit digital graphics. So I kind of already mentioned some terms like pixels in an image and digital image, but let's just kind of break down, okay, what digital graphics is and why is that relevant for us? So I'll give you a little bit of that overview. Um, again, hopefully most of you are already familiar with these concepts uh, from your maybe high school and just private interests. But if not, then this is a great time to learn it because it's just essential to basically everything that we do in design these days as um, this is just this is just essential so it's great great to learn uh, okay so on a computer we can basically have very roughly speaking two so there are two kind of very broad graphic types or so we can display images or visual um, visual data in a computer using two different paradigms so one of them is called vector representation it's here on the left or vector graphics and the other one is called raster graphics um, and depending on what we want to show we will use either one or the other one and sometimes we will just combine these two okay so in rhino we work with vector graphics it means the shapes are defined as as curves and surfaces so they are defined in a very geometrical way and there are some benefits to that for example i can just I can zoom in onto this shape as far as I want, and I will never, I will never, uh, I will never lose resolution. Or so it has kind of infinite detail, um, and that's why vector graphics is used for typography, so letters, uh, plans, drawings, diagrams, um, so on. Also in computer games, um, but this is not enough. Or so I cannot. There are obviously images that I cannot easily show using this way. Um, so that's why raster graphics is, uh, is, is there. So basically all images that you see, so all kind of photographs on a computer are stored in this raster, raster format. Or, uh, so it just, raster just means like a grid. There's a grid, there are pixels, and there's some number of pixels you know, in the X direction and in the Y direction. And if I multiply, I get the total number of pixels. I can talk about an image has this number of megapixels. Or so if I say a one megapixel image, is 1 million pixels, so mega is million. Um, what is 1 million pixels? That's 1,000 times 1,000. Or so if I have an image that is 1,000 by 1,000, that's one megapixel. And, um, and then there are different compression formats. So not, not all raster images are stored the same way in a computer, but in rough way, there are pixels. And each pixel is basically one color. And this color exists in a, in a way, I can kind of map this color in sort of a color space. So I can talk about coordinates or color coordinates of the color. So again, I'm talking about an image in a very mathematical way or because I have basically a field filled with numbers and these numbers are somehow points in the color space or so kind of very abstract and mathematical. But basically, if you work in image processing or in a digital way, you just have to understand, it's good to understand these, these things a little bit in detail. Um, yeah. Okay, so these are two types of graphics. And the problem with raster graphics is that it does not have infinite detail. Or so if I zoom into the image, uh, I will start seeing pixels. Or, and then pixels, I cannot zoom. I can kind of zoom into them, but they are just, the resolution remains the same. So raster images look great if I have a lot of pixels, but basically uh, if I just start stretching the image, I will, I will reach a limit or so. Uh, um, but again, I have um, a lot of detail kind of depending on how small the pixels are. Okay, this is actually how it can look like. Uh, this is actually, if you zoom out with your head or kind of squint your eyes, you will see, I think this is Abe Lincoln. This is actually from, a, I'm not sure actually from where this is, but basically every, um, yeah, 
every cell just has a value and this value just exists in a computer and um, here specifically this is a grayscale value or so it goes from 0 to 255 which is um, 256 values so 256 shades of gray and uh, two, two, 256 is 2 to the power of 8 so that means it's 8 bit 8 bit um, grayscale or so if I'm in Photoshop and I have an image and I put in grayscale I can choose it can be 8 bit but I can have more bits I can have 24 or something 16 uh, so I can have kind of I can increase this, uh, have even a higher resolution, but usually this 8 bit is perfectly enough for most grayscale images. Okay, so that's raster graphics and uh, vector graphics. Basically, in a computer, in a computer memory, a little bit looks looks like this. You will never really see, um, so you will never see in Rhino shapes displayed like this. But this is in a way how they how they exist. Mm. So, for example, this rectangle would be defined through four points. And there's actually five points here. And the reason is because the first point and the last point are the same. Or because I want to, if you think about, if I want to draw a rectangle, and if I want to tell you how to draw a rectangle, I would say, okay, put your pen on point number one. Now go to point number two, point number three, point number four. But then I'm still not done. Or I have four points. But in order to finish the rectangle, I need to go back to point number one. So in a way, my rectangle, I need to kind of, tell you to then go back to point number one. So that's why here in this list, there are actually five values. Okay, and I can kind of, in a way, these points then define this rectangle. So I don't need any more information than this in order to draw this rectangle. Also think about it a little bit. Also, how much information I need to show this image here, also kind of very low res pixelated. And, and here I can kind of do it with a table that is three by five, I guess, so 15 values. Of course, here I'm just drawing a rectangle, and here I'm drawing a whole image. Uh -huh. So, depends on what you what I need. If I do, if I'm a, if I'm an architect and I draw um, shapes, so kind of line drawings, then this is perfectly in, enough for me. Okay, so that's that's a little bit the idea. And okay, okay, and um, ah. so um. This map is on my courses as well under materials. So this is actually a base plan of Helsinki in vector format. And this you will use, or you can use, but I think you should use it as the base for your drawing. Or, and I will not show you today how to load it in yet. Maybe I'll show it next time, but um, you can basically get sort of floor plans. So the, yeah, the floor plan of all the buildings in Helsinki. I'm not sure exactly how updated it is. Uh, it could be already a few years old. So maybe some buildings are just not there. You can figure that out if you look a little bit at some of the newer areas. Uh, do they exist or not? Yeah, this is for sure not the current situation here. Um, <clears throat> okay, and basically this map is just there available for you and it's in the ve it's in vector format. You can just open it in Rhino and literally go and copy paste, uh, you know, blocks and uh, um, sort of buildings or areas that you that you need. Again, this is not enough because you still need the height. And I'll show you today a little bit how to, I'll show you today basically how you can go about it. Or, uh, so how you kind of add height in this drawing here. So this is just like very, very basic plan. Okay, and then there's, uh, on my courses, there are more resources. There, there are actually more, um, more things there, which again, you don't really need for this assignment but I just want to show it to you. So let's say you, you actually do want heights and you maybe want a, let's say, high resolution model of Helsinki. And um, so this, this already exists. So the whole city is scanned. And um, again, on my courses materials, if you scroll down, uh, I gave you links to, uh, to this. So you can actually download parts of Helsinki and then you can uh, download it in different resolutions. Or so this one on the left is kind of a lower resolution. So this is also a texture model. So um, meaning the actual textures that you see on this model are actually from the photographs. Or, okay, so you can kind of choose different res resolution of this model because of course, maybe sometimes you, for some, in some cases you would want to have the whole city, you know, as a model. So in that case, you might choose with lower resolution because it's just faster. Uh, or sometimes you, no, no, I, you have an area, you maybe have one building and you want to kind of, focus on that so we take a higher resolution of a smaller area or it's because you cannot really load a full resolution of the whole city into rhino this you cannot do because it's just 
to have it more. So it's about kind of choosing the level of detail. Okay, uh -huh, here you can see it a bit better. So this is actually Kalion Kirko. Um, yeah, kind of how it, how it sort of looks like. Okay, and, um, and again, the, the reason why I also show you this is to draw attention a little bit that uh, when we work in the digital realm, we are kind of, um, we are kind of, um, you know, we have to basically, we have to sort of, well, not only the digital realm, but in general, when we talk about sort of design and showing, you know, drawing buildings and, and, and uh, visualizing space, we in a way have to choose how we displayed or how we display this, uh, this, you know, volumes, these spaces, this geometry. And uh, again, this again has nothing to do really with digital tools, but because uh, I can talk about these techniques as well, uh, just when I'm doing a hand drawing on a paper, but you know, very roughly I can talk about again, kind of a pixel drawing. So I can talk about sort of photograph um, uh, where I, I just have kind of pixels or and they kind of show everything that is happening, but in this kind of raster way, it's very hard to modify this geometry. Then I have to basically kind of paint the image to change it. Or I can have um, sort of wireframe models. So I'm just looking at, I'm basically saying, edge of surfaces are lines and that's the only thing I have. So I would have this kind of a, um, you know, transparent X-ray sort of model where I only have, yeah, just like a model created from wires. If you think about it, your plans that you will also draw in the future, they're a little bit like this. So they might, the surfaces between might not be filled, but they're just, you just see lines, that's it. Uh, then the second level is, so I'm kind of now increasing them in information or so uh, the amount of information that I'm adding. So I can say, no, I actually want to talk about surfaces or so there's like a surface. So it's not only lines, but in between lines, there are some surfaces. Or so if I have a wall and there's a window on it, that's a hole in the surface. Or so I can kind of show this very nicely. And then I'm putting these surfaces together and creating kind of, it's almost like a cardboard model, but it's like a surface based model. And again, in Rhino, this would be like a poly surface model. And then the final step is in a way talking about the volumes or so I'm not even talking about surfaces, but I'm just talking about like a full geometry. Like I'm talking about the volume of space. So the kind of, um, my model is basically somehow filled or so all the shapes are closed. I never, I can never really access individual surfaces, but they're always part of a closed volume. And um, you could also think of it well, but this is, this volume is just composed of different surfaces. This is true, but it, it really kind of matters how you kind of represent these things. Because for example, this model here, if I define it through these volumes, I can actually 3D print this model. So I can send it to a 3D printer and I can print it. It's because the printer knows what is inside and what is outside. Or the printer knows that it's placing material inside walls or volumes, and it's not placing it outside. Or, but when I have a surface-based model, then it's not really clear what's inside, what's outside. I mean, here it's kind of easy to see. So the distinction between inside and outside, it's, it's clear. But, you know, it might not be that clear to a computer exactly um, what, what is inside and where the, you know, free printing, where the, where the free printer should place the material and where not. Or so it actually doesn't matter how the things are sort of uh, represented in a, in a, computer. But again, you have the same problems when you are working, for example, if you do a physical model um, of a building, you know, are you doing it with cardboard and just flat pieces or do you have like full wood and then you're carving it out? So you're also making in a way a little bit similar uh, decisions. Okay, let me just see the time a little bit. It's two o'clock. Um, I'll try to just pull this through and then uh, hopefully in 10, 15 minutes we are done and then we take a short break and then we do a tutorial. Okay, so I talked about basically how visual information is somehow stored in a computer, but uh, there's, a, there's, let's say, another thing that we have to uh, be aware of. Those are basic graphical projections. Okay, so I showed this image already in the last lecture. Um, that is, we have a three-dimensional world, so spatial world, and we want to show it on a flat paper or computer screen. And uh, we basically need to kind of, we need to project that geometry onto the, onto the paper or onto the flat, flat surface. Uh, so this is called a projection. It's a mathematical technique. And, and uh, yeah, this is basically kind of looking at the drawing as a, as a construction. 
So uh, there are different types of projections. Again, we will not really go into that too much, but it's something that you have to be aware of that I can create. Um, yeah, I, I, I can kind of do this, for example, perspective projection, which is how, how our eyes see, or at least one of our eyes sees. Um, when I talk about axonometry, I'm talking about kind of isometric projection where the lines are par parallel. So these projection lines are parallel. Um, um, yeah, and when some of the surf, when the surface of the object is sort of parallel with my viewing plane, then we can talk about elevations. Uh, and sometimes I want to do a, what we will also do is this so-called oblique projection. Also, it's a kind of a where the, uh, where I can kind of freely choose how these projection lines look like, or so I can get uh, so I can kind of have them going from one point. I can have them parallel, or I can kind of sort of completely freely choose how these lines go. In that way, I'm getting an oblique uh, projection. We'll actually be using um, a so-called military projection, which is drawn here. It's a bit related. Well, there's Cavalier and this cabinet one. They're kind of a little bit related, but we'll use this military projection. I'll just show you how to do it in Rhino and, and why did we choose that one? Or so why I think it's actually very convenient to use. So these are kind of different types of graphical projections. Once long ago, or at least when I was a student, uh, it was normal for architects to study descriptive geometry. So you would have a course called descriptive geometry, and you would learn this in the course. Unfortunately, again, I didn't really study in Finland, so I don't know if I, I, I assumed once there was a course on descriptive geometry at Alto, but it doesn't exist anymore. It could also be that it never existed. But in many, many schools around the architecture schools around the world, Descriptive geometry is still part of the curriculum. And this, this is basically math that just describes how to, how to draw things in projections. Uh, so it's kind of very technical. And today it's considered that you don't really need it because uh, you have a computer that kind of does everything for you. So that's maybe a question for you as well. You know, do you need it or not? I mean, some things are not really that complicated. And there, if you draw them kind of on paper, they can be also very annoying take long to construct. Of course, much easier if you do it on a computer, but you just, you just have to be aware that there's this whole body of knowledge, um, again, called descriptive geometry, which we cannot really go into, but it's sort of implicit in, in when, we do a, when we do a drawing in Rhino, we are kind of always thinking about how things should look like, so they look kind of good. Uh, they give us impression of a three-dimensional object, even though this is just a two-dimensional drawing. Okay, uh, this example we'll do today. Actually, this is the example we today, but it's derived from this one here. So this is just a simple stone arch. Uh, this in the left is so-called cabinet projection, and the right is the so-called military projection. And the difference is that you can see here in the cabinet projection, the name says it like if you are a cabinet maker, um, you would use it because then the, it's kind of one, at least one face, so one side of your model is not distorted. So it's undistorted. The, you have right angles. Um, so this is like a square, and there's their right angles here. Also, this side that is in front is not distorted. The top one is distorted, and the left one is distorted, or this one on the side is distorted. So this angle is, it looks obviously less than 90 degrees, but in reality, this is 90 degrees. Or, but of course, if you want to show the front and the side, we need to, something needs to be this, this distorted. Or, and in cabinet projection, we just choose that the side is not distorted and everything else is. And in the military projection, we choose that the top is not distorted. Or so the top, this is actually a floor plan. This is a square, and this is right, uh, this is uh, 90 degrees. So the sides are distorted and the top is kind of not distorted. And again, the reason why this is made useful for us is because we can use Helsinki base plan to take the floor plans of the buildings and just use them directly. So then you don't, you can start drawing from these floor plans. You don't need to do anything else with them. You can just start drawing on top of them directly. And that's why it's maybe, it's maybe kind of useful for us to, uh, well, we will just use it. Or, so we could, again, make different decisions as well, but that's how we will start. Um, and uh, yeah, this is an example that we try to do today, a little bit in Rhino. So how do you construct this drawing? Again, I'll show it to you today in Rhino, but basically it's just a series of operations. I draw a top side and the kind of side. That's how I start. And then I, the, uh, the top, I'm kind of not 
really distorting. I'm just rotating it. So he, these are actually also the um, commands in Rhino. Also, all these are commands in Rhino that you can use to, to achieve this. So you can use this as a small cheat sheet for today. I rotate the top side. Then I mirror this side. Mirroring means just creating a mirrored image. Then there's something called scale 1D. So I'm kind of squeezing these sides here. So I'm scaling, but only along one axis. I can also do it, um, scale it along two axis. I'm just scaling the object. But here I'm doing it along one axis, so kind of squeezing the object. I squeeze these two sides, so they align here with these two points. And then there's another operation called shear, which is like, um, it's like shearing. So it's kind of uh, distorting the drawing further. And then if I do it in this way, I'm basically, I created, um, so I kind of created now or I constructed how these sides should look like in this uh, military projection. And then I have to add a little bit extra things here to, to kind of show the size of these columns here. So if I just add a little bit extra, I have sort of this three-dimensional drawing is already constructed and then I kind of do shading. Uh, so this is dark, uh, maybe one side is a bit lighter uh, and then this is kind of white and then I can do like a thick outside border. So it looks even nicer, kind of you perceive it as a volume that is separate from the paper. And that's how I can kind of quickly create a nice maybe drawing. Okay, and then um, this is something similar, but a bit more complex. So I could have a, a city block. This is actually a city block from Helsinki. I don't know exactly where, but I literally took it from this Helsinki base map. I can rotate it. And then I'm basically adding these, I'm adding these heights or so I'm just kind of copying the heights. Of course, I should know what the heights are. Uh, and then I'm kind of finishing up Kind of basically copying the floor plans up and then i'm just finishing everything up i get this wireframe model now everything is kind of transparent so i have to kind of again squint my eyes and understand like how ah, this is in front this is in back and then i have to trim so i basically start deleting or trimming the lines that are not visible and then i get this one okay so this is not really a 3d model this is just a two-dimensional we are drawing and just doing it directly a two-dimensional projection um, of, of this of this um, of this block or so in theory I could create a three-dimensional model and then create from then create a um, projection automatically which I'll also show you how to do but it's um, then we would have to go into 3d modeling and I just don't want to start with that now at the beginning uh, but just kind of think of it as so all these rules they're all valid also if you do it on paper except that of course on paper you cannot do this so you cannot for example you couldn't do the squeezing. Uh, the scale 1D is a bit harder to do on paper if you think about it. Like you can't really take a part of a drawing and just squeeze it. Right? But here, it, this is possible. So, and also shearing. Uh, shearing is also not really possible to, to do on paper. So there are some things that are just harder. But here, because we work in the digital realm, we can kind of move these lines around. Okay, another example of how to do a gable roof. Uh, and yeah, again, hopefully there's going to be some time today to show this as well. So I chose a little bit more complex shape here. So you, this is a shape, we already have the volume. We draw this, it's called a ridge. So the gable roof has a ridge. So it's like the highest, um, the highest line or the highest point on the roof. Um, and these are these ridge lines. Then there's some things that I know about them. I know that that's these ridge lines that the height of the roof is maximum. So that's the height of the triangle. Uh, and then, if I have these, then I can actually close the triangles, or because they know how they look like, because I have three points, I can close the triangles, and then I basically get my roof shapes. And then again, I trim the lines that are not seen, they are inside the roof. And then I can go on by adding, um, um, just adding kind of, just copying these lines in parallel to create sort of a, a surface of the roof. And uh, this is already enough to kind of uh, show that you know how this roof and there's some structure on the roof and it's separate from the sides of the building and you know this is actually rather quick to do okay another example same thing but a bit a uh, few more examples of just different gable roofs so these ones are also in the in my courses as example files so you can have a look at them and i'll put them also in the tutorial folder so you can just open them in rhino and just have a look at them how they, how they look like but they're actually quite also fun at least for me <laughs> to construct, it's like just drawing one-on-one. Okay, um, I'll try to speed up a bit. So here you can actually see these are all the, so these are not all the commands that you can use in Rhino. So these are just some operations we can use in Rhino. That's not all of them. 
as you actually have hundreds or even thousands of commands. But these are the, maybe when you draw a working rhino, maybe like 80% of the time you're using these commands. And here I even put um, like a small star, they are kind of 2D drawing essential. Or so when you just draw in 2D, then only these ones that are marked are essential and should have maybe created a separate list where only those ones are on the list. For example, you don't need to think about, um, you know, I don't know, like contouring, you don't have to think about because contouring works on three dimensional objects, uh, flow along surface. So we can, don't really work with surfaces because everything is flat. So we don't need that command, but many of the other ones we can use, for example, explode. We have a bunch of lines that are connected. We can kind of explode them so we can um, get components of these lines. We can extend the line, we can offset the line, rotate. Um, create a point, polyline, mirror, and so on. So, and it looks like a lot, but it's really not. It's maybe, I didn't count, but you know, we're talking about maybe 20 commands. And once when you start using them, they become, you know, part of your repertoire and you kind of, you don't need to consult the sheet anymore. You just kind of use it. Or so that's why practicing is very important. Like in this course, you, you should practice drawing and you should dive into Rhino ASAP and just, you know, use this. Uh, okay. And then, a little bit, this is kind of for the end. Uh, actually, it's not really the end, but I will, uh, might have to cut some parts of this presentation. Uh, so this is an, another good reference to drawing in general. Uh, Massimo Scolari, it's also quite a recent book, 2012. Well, it's actually almost 10 years old, but rather recent, um, called Oblique Drawing. Or so it kind of talks about this the history of anti-perspective. And basically we are drawing in, using an oblique drawing or so military perspective is or military projection is an oblique drawing. And here, I think it's just a very, there are a lot of references that kind of show how this is also a military uh, perspective. So it just shows kind of how drawing was used uh, throughout history. And, um, and yeah, this is actually a cabinet perspective, uh, kind of example from the East. Uh, so none of these things are really new. Uh, some of them have been around for quite some time. This is actually an example from Korea. Um, and again, you know, if you ever played computer games or um, mobile games or whatever, uh, you know, that's, these techniques are also then used, of course, in those games as well. This is actually SimCity, like a city simulator, pretty old one. Um, and again, it uses uh, basically military uh, projection because it's just very, very convenient. Okay, another example. So again, the floor plan is not distorted. So these are all right angles, just kind of everything is cut. Um, and you look from underneath. Another example of military perspective this is actually um, one of my examples. Uh, so yeah, just kind of plan is not distorted and then everything is just built up from the plan up. Um, and then these examples I already showed um, uh, use the kind of same technique, um, of same projection, okay. And this is actually the last part. And then um, I will not really go now into details, but I just want to quickly, quickly finish up with saying, um, okay, now I showed kind of a lot of techniques, but basically, you know, it, you, I hope you're not over, overwhelmed, but uh, these are just all the things that you will learn throughout your studies. Or so you'll not learn them in the first year, you might not learn them in the second year, but you should get familiar with them really quickly. So it's just something that you will learn also through practice they're never they're not really taught directly for example in design courses you might not learn them at all but you will have to use them more but i teach them because i think it's just cool to teach things that you're supposed to use okay so how do you learn them or how should you learn uh well i tried to kind of create this small give you a small overview so you know you're in your bachelor first year maybe maybe second year uh, you should get familiar with this you know vector workflows and raster workflows like really quickly there's another course that I do a uh, visual storytelling elective, which is in spring, third period, I think a fourth one, I forgot. Um, and that one teaches Photoshop, which is a raster workflow. So if you go through these two, you're kind of covered quite well. And then there's this sort of hybrid workflow where you're creating a portfolio in InDesign, or you're doing like you're doing visualizations with V-Ray, so kind of a yeah, professional visualizations. These are kind of hybrid techniques. So then maybe in the third year, you should learn computer-aided architectural design like architecture. Even though some of you, if you go to architectural offices already, 
early on, you might need to learn this even earlier, but I'm actually against this. So I, I don't think you should learn architect. I don't think you should use architect in the first year um, because it's, I mean, then you're uh, not to kind of, not to kind of uh, be too negative, but I think if you learn architect too early, you kind of destroy your chances of learning anything. Well, I think you might kind of, mm. I think it might be just harder for you to then uh, to unlearn some of the some of the things that are taught in this, you know, because architect is created, architect is a very kind of narrow-minded software created for like one purpose, and that's to streamline drafting. So creating plans in creating plans in uh, in architectural offices. And again, you can use it and learn it, and then you go to an office and then you're just a machine. And then after that, I mean that's then you can do that your whole life. But I think um, yeah, so there's a question. This, there are not really Revit courses at Alto. There is some architect done in the third year. Um, yeah, there is architect course done in the third year. I think it's in the third year. Um, so you do actually learn it. But um, but again, the reason why I use Rhino is because it's 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 more general. Or so it's not only for architects. It's it's more it's a more general kind of modeling and drawing software, and it think enables you later to do also kind of a lot more. Even though of course in the end you can use architect because Sometimes you just need to do things fast, and that's just the standard in the industry. But if you learn architect in the first year, I think you you might kind of uh, you might not end up being a good architect in the end. You might be a good draftsman and a good worker in an office, but I think that's not the goal. Okay, and there's some other workflows like raster workflow, which would use Photoshop, and then hybrid ones. And I just tried to give you like here a little bit of an overview what they are about. Like there's always an analog equivalent to these workflows, or so. A raster workflow in Photoshop was modeled according to photography. The name from the, of the software comes from Photoshop, like a place where you develop photos. Or, and, um, and then uh, Illustrator was done for, made for illustrators, coming from graphical design mostly. And Rhino was done for kind of basically mechanical engineers that you know, work with just line, line drawings. And, and all of these are they're somehow tailored to different industries or to, to different professions. Uh, and, and that's also important to kind of to sort of un understand that they kind of make certain things easier, but they also limit you in a way. And I think at the very beginning with studies, you shouldn't be limited. And again, Archicad is in the name, it says it's just tailored to architects, uh, to architects, uh, to architects. So, um, and that's it. And then Archicad and Revit are kind of competing for market dominance. Okay. Um, okay. And then, but there are other alternatives also. Um, I listed them here. You can have a look at them maybe uh, later in this lecture uh, at home. And so there are many different alternatives. And again, the why are we using this one? It's just it's sometimes it's just a bit cultural. So whatever your teacher was using in his, or is using in his professional life, that's what the students will learn. But I also think again that Rhino is uh, general enough that uh, it's powerful, but also general enough that it doesn't limit you these first years and again i'm using it also in the masters and in my professional work so you can for sure continue using it all the way all the way into your professional life